So we're called upon to see what love can do in this world with the ugly truths we've been confronted with. And we are very pleased to have our friend Five back with us this morning. Thank you kindly for coming right up here. You've been amazing. I'm, we're standing in his solitary cell now, but he's not solitary at this moment, <laughs> thankfully. Five is going to introduce our principal speaker this morning, who is Glenn Martin, and I'm going to let you do the introductions. We've changed our schedule around a little bit. We are also minus our very savvy tech person, so we're going to be maybe having some... We're going to be great. We're going to be great, but I'm just saying, don't promise more than you can deliver. I'm just preparing people for the possibility that we might not be moving as swiftly between things as we have, as we have sometimes. Um, and what we will have after that is a reactor panel. I don't want to call it a reactor as much as a fill-in panel of John Dye, Harrell, and Lynn Burke, and Tyrone Wirtz to fill in their experiences in the re-entry process and the things that they have learned and have to tell us. So let us prayerfully prepare for our message this morning. I'm going to run this more seamlessly um, so that we're going to go right back to back and then there'll be time for our questions. If you have personal needs, feel free to get up and attend to those. Thank you, Five. Thank you. And thank you all for coming here early this morning and being up and, and, and ready to be activated again. You know, it is a great honor um, and it's not every day uh, that you meet someone and, uh, that can impact your life in a leadership role. You know, when, when I first uh, came home, I was right out the gate running, <laughs> trying to do everything. And I, I met this man outside of a conference because we had these little conversations where the conference was going on, but we always had these previous incarcerated people conversations outside the conference because our voices wasn't validated to be inside. And I came to him because he's a legend on the inside because for the years that I was locked up, he was out here representing those previously incarcerated, being that voice, right? I came to him with all these problems. I want to do this. He said, hey, 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 man, hold on. Own that shit. Own your problem. And if you don't see anybody with the solution, then that means you're the solution. So I'm going to own my problem. I had the honor of receiving an award and they, I had a call about this award, and they're like, oh, we're going to give you, oh, I don't care about no award, I don't want that, give it to somebody else. Well, we're giving you the Glenn Martin Award for Advocate of the Year. Oh, I'll be there. What time is this? I'll be there. Bro. So I wish I had the time, and honestly, maybe if we started to talk about the things this man has done on the beginning of the conference, I don't think I have four days to speak about all the things that this man has done, but... The greatest thing he's done for me was hope. Hope is the most powerful tool. You take hope away, you take away the future. This man has brought hope to those who have the hopeless, who have been shown that there is no hope in society. And I say that because it's not just about leadership and who's in leadership. It's about the just leadership and who should just be there. Because those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. That without talking on and blabbering on furtherly, uh, it's my great honor to introduce a man who has not only led others, but paved the way, but now has created the mechanism to put those previously incarcerated first. Not last, first. If I could look back 12 years from now and hopefully be successful, I would love to be anywhere close to what this man has done. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the founder and creator of Just Leadership USA, but also the founder of Hope for Us Previously Incarcerated, Mr. Glenn Martin. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. This is great. I'm psyched. Um, I love audiences, but I particularly love audiences where I don't recognize faces. And, uh, you know, in, in this field, you can find yourself uh, preaching to the choir a lot. And um, I love to get into spaces with people I haven't met before, but people who already understand why we're having this discussion. Um, five, you know, I appreciate all the kind words that you said, but the truth is that I stand on the shoulders of people who come before me, and I stand on the shoulders of my peers who are out there <coughs> banging away at this issue, just like I am. And five, as everyone in this room probably already knows, is one of the key leaders amongst folks directly impacted in this movement. Yes. Um, and someone, uh, I appreciate you saying, I teach you things, but I learn a lot from you also. And so thank you for the gracious introduction. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, journey. I didn't prepare anything. In fact, where's my PowerPoint? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, thank you for that. <laughs> but I didn't prepare anything on purpose because I wanted this to be a conversation. I know there's going to be some respondents afterwards. So I look forward to this being a really sort of energetic conversation. So a little bit about myself. I know when I'm listening to speakers, um, I spent a lot of time figuring out who is this person almost before I even listened to the message they have. So let's start there. Um, Thirteen and a half years ago, I walked out of prison in New York State after serving six years for robbery. And I always remember about three or four different stories attached to that prison experience. And I, I hope to sort of tell each of them as I talk to you for 30 minutes or so today. Um, but the one I want to tell you most is how difficult prison was for me on the last day. The day I finally let my emotions come out in prison was the day I was leaving. The day I gathered up the things that I had accumulated, accumulated that fit into a square about this. Is this a coincidence that this is no. a... No. You put me in prison again? No. The, the, day, is above your head. the day, for folks who can't see, there's a square here the size of a prison cell. Anyone who's been in prison knows, like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to make parole. <laughs> um, so, gathered up all my stuff, and I'm walking down the walkway, and it's a long walk in the particular prison I was in, uh, almost a half a mile from the housing block to the administrative building. And I, I found myself crying. And I was crying because of the people I was leaving behind. In America, we, locked up, we lock up some of our best and brightest. And when you're in prison, you don't have the material things. You don't have the clothing and the car and the home and all that stuff that sort of speaks for you. What you have is your character. And so the 2,000 men I spent six years with, I got to know many of them and their character at their core. And what I was reminded of is that prison is not where we send bad people who do bad things, right? Because then the question would be, where do we send good people who do bad things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my experience was that many of the people there obviously were not the culmination of one, two, or ten things that they had done wrong, any more than any other human being is. And I said to myself, you've got to carry that with you. Like, it's going to be, like, when you get past this administrative gate, and when you get on that bus, and when you get to New York, there's going to be so many other things happening that you may forget this moment. And so singe this moment into your mind. And so I held on to that. And I came home. I had a two-year liberal arts degree that I earned while I was in prison. And obviously, that was part of me uh, having an opportunity to do things differently. I'm not going to say turn my life around. I have a hard time with this statement about turning your life around because it makes a bunch of assumptions about who goes to prison um, and who they are in their being, right? So, so let's not uh, try not to use that terminology. Um, but I'll tell you what did happen. A correction counselor did say to me, wow, look at your grades. You should go to college. It was that moment, right? So people often say, well, when did things change? And it's so easy to say, oh, I got this two-year college degree, and that changed things. Not really, right? Like, the, the moment I could think of that really started leading to me thinking differently was this person in a position of authority who didn't have to show any compassion or caring in that moment, someone who actually worked for the system, 
who took a moment out and said that they saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself at the time, and then sent me 10 hours upstate New York um, to where this small uh, college program existed. And I remember watching a film about the Holocaust. And it wasn't like I've never heard of the Holocaust. I grew up in Bedside, Brooklyn, very tough neighborhood uh, in the 70s and 80s. And when you grow up in those neighborhoods, you adopt a narrative that allows you to survive in those spaces. And I remember watching the Holocaust and watching a bulldozer pull up to dead, naked human bodies piled five high, and then shoveling those bodies, the cold steel against human flesh, into a hole in the ground, a mass grave. And I remember how that moment sort of dug into the story that I had created that allowed me to engage in the behavior I was engaging in and reminded me, unlike what I had carried with me for so many years, that human beings are so much more alike than we are different. And unfortunately, we live in a country where it's all about othering. I sent out a, t a tweet earlier, just before I got here about 30 minutes ago, about a leadership training we have coming up at Just Leadership USA for formerly incarcerated uh, leaders. And someone tweeted back and said, is this a parody? And I wrote him back, I said, no, but what inspired that question? And he said, well, people with criminal records can't get a job. He said, felons can't get a job. Yeah. And I wrote him back, I said, one, that's not true. Two, this is not job training. And three, maybe if we didn't call them felons, they'd be able to get a job, right? Oh, it was right. very dehumanizing. <laughs> and he wrote back and said, well, if they didn't commit the crime, they wouldn't be called felons, right? Yeah. And this is, what we, this is what Americans do. This is what we've been taught to do, that to make ourselves feel good, we have to other, right. other folks, right? And use the language of the system to define people so that we know the difference between them and ourselves. Um, my older brother grew up to be a federal correction officer for 10 years. I forgive him. <laughs> uh, he's a U.S. Marshal now, and I love him, but he is part of the system, and systems change people long before people change systems. Yeah. And as I hear him talking about the system that he works for, obviously he's not someone who engages in abusive behavior, but still he has this narrative about how I didn't put these people here. Yeah. And as long as I'm not hurting them, then I'm doing my job, and they got themselves here, and blah, blah, blah. And so every time I'm on social media, and every time I'm in spaces where I'm not talking to the choir, I'm just reminded of this uh, narrative that Americans have about who is involved in our criminal justice system. And it harkens back to that day when I left prison because even as a person who went to prison, I had my own assumptions about who I was going to meet, right? I was scared to death, especially at the Rikers was tough, Rikers yeah. Holland was tough. And then I thought like, wow, I have to do that for like five more years. And then I get to state prison, and that just wasn't the case. And part of it is that people are beyond the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And, 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 and yet it changed me fundamentally as a person. Like it changed my heart, and it changed my mind. And I believe that we can change Americans' hearts and minds if we allowed people like myself to have the access, the resources, and the skill sets to speak directly to Americans. That this can't just be about changing policy, this can't just be about economics, this can't just be about changing laws, because in the end, we make decisions without gut. That's right. Right? right. You can show me all the data in the world. I'll get blown away for a second. Wow, 65 million Americans have a criminal record on file. 2.3 million Americans locked up any given day. 8 million altogether under correctional supervision. Those things make people say, whoa. And then two days later, you ask them the numbers. They're like, ah, I think it was 60. <laughs> Million, right? But because in the end, if you're scared enough, you'll pay anything to keep that which you fear, that which you fear away from you. I mean, on Rikers Island in New York City, it costs one hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars per person per year. New Yorkers are pretty savvy. They know that's very expensive, and yet they continue to pay it. And the cost is going to continue to go up because the number of people there continues to go down. So the per person cost just going to continue to skyrocket. I mean, we locked up kids in New York up until three years ago to the tune of two hundred and sixty thousand dollars per child per year. So I understand we have this whole right left thing going on, this right left coalition now, the left and the right getting together on criminal justice reform. But we're not going to hit a tipping point based on economics. If you look historically in this country, 
we had tipping points when Americans finally stand up and say what we're doing is wrong. Right. So I walk out of prison, I have this college degree, I'm ready to go, and I visit 50 employers. And almost every single one said no outright. And the one or two that offered me the job, by the time I got home later on that evening, changed their mind. And I was stably housed. I didn't have an addiction issue. I had a college degree. That's unlike most people exiting prison, right? And yet, I couldn't find a job anywhere. And I owed $100,000. 53000 in child support arrears and 47000 in fines, fees, and restitution. 47000 Correct. To the state. To the state. Almost all of it was owed to the state. Even the child support was owed to the state. It was the state recuperating from Medicaid paid to the child and the child's mother. So, because we try to pay for our criminal justice system on the backs of people who are serving time, right? That is a decision we've made. Um, is that, yes, it's becoming expensive, but wait a minute, maybe we can make them pay for it. So most people would do what they know best, right? Most, I mean, who, who can imagine getting their first paycheck and it's reduced by 65% post-tax and then wanting to go to work the next day? Yeah. Right? So I went to a re-entry organization, and they got me a job at a law firm, a public interest law firm called the Legal Action Center in New York. And the job was sitting at the front desk, answering the phones, making $17,000 per year. I used to make $17,000 in a day. And yet, I had already made a bunch of decisions where there was no option to go back to doing what I was doing. And so I sat in that law firm, and I did the best job I could at answering that phone. And then I realized some of the people who were calling this law firm were some of the people I would like to have a voice with. Right? They were like, the mayor called there. The governor's office called there. State legislators called there. The city council called there. And so suddenly I was even more interested in what was happening at this law firm. And I became a paralegal. And at this particular law firm, serving as a paralegal wasn't your traditional paralegal job where you're just doing uh, legal memos and so on. You're actually representing people. So I was representing people who are formerly incarcerated, who are trying to get housing, access to education, access to employment. And so I spoke to thousands of people in a two and a half year period, maybe two, three thousand, and represented a handful of people over those two and a half years. And that is when I learned what Five said, right? Which is, I can rely on my own story, but that's not enough, right? I'm just one person, it's an anecdotal. I quickly learned that it is not about, just about individual responsibility, it's about systemic barriers. When you hear the same story over and over again, people coming up against the same systemic barriers, you realize this is not about the individuals. This is about decision making as a society, about putting up barriers to get in the way of people who are trying to uh, get it together and regain their dignity and regain their lives. I also learned that the people closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And I never let that go. I learned quickly that the men and women I was talking to on the phone knew what they needed, knew what they wanted, were very aware of what the barriers were. And yet at the same time, I found that the field I was working in wasn't putting enough stock in. Right? wasn't bringing them to the table in a way that felt genuine, in a way that felt like it was about leadership. And so I stayed at the law firm for six and a half years, and I learned a lot. I learned how to do policy work very top-down, very top-down. I made friends with legislators in New York State, conservative legislators. Um, I made friends with uh, our friends, our allies on the right, on, on the uh, assembly side. And I drafted bills and got, got them passed. Um, but I came across a ton of barriers beyond just the employment barrier. I remember getting off parole and registering the vote, because in New York State you get your vote back the day you get off parole. You don't need anything. You don't need a letter. You don't need, a, you don't need anything. And yet, when I went to register, instead of getting back my voter ID card, I got back just that, a letter saying I needed a letter from parole telling me I had the right to vote. 
in violation of the law, right? So there's one. So so that's the other thing. There's the law that becomes a barrier to people re-entering, and then there's practice, yeah. and then there's people's attitudes. There's all you know. There's all these other ways that people are barred. So when you hear that 5.8 million Americans won't vote in the upcoming election because they have a felony, that number is probably closer to 25 million. Right. Because so many people are disenfranchised based on misinformation or based on the attitudes of people who are in decision-making roles. So I left the law firm and went to go work for the Fortune Society, a re-entry organization that's been around since 1967. I always see heads shake yes, because Fortune's been around for so long, it's been doing good work for so long, um, that there are so many people who are connected to that agency in one way or another. And for folks who are not familiar with it, um, what I love about this agency is that it was founded by uh, David Rothenberg, who was a theater agent at the time for Elizabeth Taylor and all these other folks. But it was founded as a result of a manuscript he got his hands on called Fortune in Men's Eyes, written by a person who had done time in prison about his experience of being in prison. And David ended up on the David Susskind show because here he was in 1967 with on Off-Broadway with a play about prison with a rape scene in the middle of the play. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. way ahead of his time and willing to spend his privilege. Yeah. Right. Let's put that in the parking lot. I want to talk about privilege before we're done and what people should do with their privilege. Um, but he was willing to spend his privilege to highlight this issue, right? And he comes back to his office after being on the David Susskind show, and there's 50 formerly incarcerated people there waiting for him, saying, I saw you on television last night, and I need your help. And he knew nothing about helping people exiting prison. And he, he did what he should have done. He asked two of the people who were on that line, can they in turn help the other folks on the line? Right. And that's how the organization was started, as a volunteer self-help advocacy organization. So they had advocacy in their DNA, even though they had grown a really large service organization. I started trouble on Twitter this morning and I feel my phone just going crazy. I'm happy about it. It means that there's a lot of stuff going on. I said some really provocative things. Um, but I gotta take it out of my pocket. It's so distracting. Um, Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, you're the culprit, right? <laughs> All right, All right get, the quote, get the quotes right, though. People are the right. Okay, okay cool. Uh, um, and, uh, and so I went there to, to do advocacy work. So I said, here's a chance for me to do advocacy work from a position where I'll be listening to the people most impacted. 4,000 people a year walking through the door. To me, that is such a wealth of knowledge, experiential yeah. knowledge and resource so that we can do the work the way it should be done. And I built the David Rothenberg Center for Public <laughs> Policy and I took over communications and I took over fundraising and somebody should have kicked me under the table. But I stayed there for six and a half years. We had a lot of success. We got, uh, we got rid of a lot of barriers to reentry facing people, particularly in New York, but we also worked in 10 other states. Um, and I had all these just weird moments. I remember being in Connecticut passing a bill, um, and I testified in front of the legis legislature and gave this really impassioned testimony. Um, and this very conservative Republican who was chairing the Judiciary Committee um, on the Senate side uh, changed his mind and passed the bill. And, and we walked out of the chamber, and I remember him walking next to me, and he was like, wow, you gave a really good speech there, really uh, gave a lot of good information to show that we can do this and that other states have done it and that Connecticut won't fall apart. He was like, I was really moved by it. Thank you. And he was like, uh, what law school did you go to? <laughs> and then the rest of the conversation was like this. <laughs> um, but all those experiences of being in those rooms with policymakers, at first people would walk out with me and say, you know, you added so much to that conversation. And I, and I always thought they were just sort of stroking my ego. I'm like, yeah. you went to Harvard, you went to Columbia, you went to, yeah, what did I really bring to the conversation? I bought experiential knowledge. Right. Right. I bought that filter, right? And that filter is so valuable when people who are not connected to the communities they're making policy um, for need that voice in the room. And, and yet at the same time, I had a moment about two years ago where I was on my way to New Orleans, and CNN called me to come on, and I said, I can't come on this evening, I'm about to get on the airplane in about an hour and a half. And they said, look, we really want someone to talk about criminal justice reform, but we want it to be someone who served time just like you. And I was like, 
who is that person? Right? At the time, there weren't many fives and there weren't many other people who had built up their skill set to be able to do this work. I, I'd say over the last year, year and a half, a lot of leaders are starting to emerge yeah. in this space. But it troubled me, right? Because people often say like, oh, Glenn, you're the exception. And yet the truth is, I was exposed to exceptional opportunities. And that's why I always talk about those opportunities out loud. Because if you look at my rap sheet, I'm not the exception. Actually, if you look at my rap sheet, you might think I'm the exception in the other direction. Like there's nothing, I am not that non-violent, first-time drug offender who's never been arrested. I don't even know who that person is. But that's the box people want to put me in. Yeah. And that's just not the case. And I always say it out loud. And I always say out loud, I started, I think my first sentence to you was, I did six years in prison for robbery. I always say that because we tend to identify the prisoner that we feel comfortable sharing with yeah. Americans to help them say, yeah, he didn't belong there. Right. She didn't belong there. And even if you win that argument, you've lost the war. Right. Because all you've said to them is have some compassion for this type of person. Not this is an insidious system that is killing families and communities and destroying hope and opportunity. And so people lose sight of the fact that it's an entire system that needs to be reformed. And so about a year and seven, eight months ago, I was in Manhattan. I was running. And I, I got to Union Square. And I was with a colleague. And the Trayvon Martin verdict happened. And it was like this sporadic rally that happened in Union Square. And this was before the Black Lives Matter stuff, before the Ferguson stuff was happening. So there wasn't that momentum that I just am in love with right now, yeah. right? Um, but I remember people were chanting, I am Trayvon Martin, I am Trayvon. And it is powerful to be in the middle of a rally with 300 people saying the same thing, right? Like you just, you just realize like how much power there is in numbers. And, and my colleague was, my colleague sort of said to me, like I'm happy to be here, but I'm, I'm gonna faint if I don't get a glass of water. We just finished running and I'm dehydrated and I need a glass of water. And I said, well, let's go across the street. And there's a cafe across the street, it's called the Coffee Shop. It's a little cute cafe, very trendy. And we go in the cafe, and as soon as I walk in, I was like, oh, no one here is Trayvon Martin. Uh -huh. And I realized how we can be in the echo chamber when we're having this discussion, and how easy it is to have a discussion about criminal justice and mass incarceration with people who already get it, and yet how uncomfortable it is to have it with people who don't already get it. And I decided at that moment, just in case, thank you for putting that in my cell. That's, that's even better. That's how a correction officer would have done it. Um, so, so I, I held that with me. I was like, when I, whatever you do next, whatever your next move is, like let's talk to new audiences. Let's sort of expand the scope. Let's talk to people who need to hear more about this, who need to be part of the solution. Let's help educate even the people who've been saying for years, we need to get the drug dealers out, the nonviolent drug dealers, right? Because you know what? The nonviolent drug dealer is the same guy with a gun in his waist the next day. Yeah. yeah, and it all depends on when those handcuffs get slapped on. He gets put on a different track, right? Get a peer coat with a gun, no good time, no early release, no work release, anything. But if you got caught the day before with the drugs and you left the gun upstairs, different outcomes, right? And we've done, I remember Rockefeller drug law reform in New York. We spent 36 years trying to convince New Yorkers that those folks didn't belong there. And then we had a big win, 2009, big win. Got rid of 95% of our mandatory minimum drug laws in New York State. Haven't passed a decent bill since then. <laughs> Because the legislature says, wait a minute, you said it was the nonviolent drug dealers. We, we gave you what you wanted. What else do you want? Right? So we won the short-term victory, but we lost the war. And we're, re, we're sort of regrouping now to try to figure out what our messaging should be. And I'm one of those people, and Five is one of those people, and a number of other folks that I work with that are saying, we got to be bold and audacious. So I took a week off of work about a year and a half ago. And I hired a friend of mine who's a lawyer to just sit with me and interview me and just like 
drill down and, and help me to flesh out what I think the voids are in the field. Why are we sort of in a series of moments but not in the middle of a movement? Mm -hmm. And how do we get to movement? And so I lucked out because it was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. And so I was in that space. I'm at home and every television station is playing it, right? And it's playing in the background and I have a three-year-old and his name is Joshua. And you know, I was like, one out of three black men before they're 18 are gonna go to prison. Yeah. Right? When it comes to me and my two brothers, two of us went to prison out of three. And so I was like, Josh is going to be 18 in 2030. And we need to shake up a field that's stuck in incrementalism. Because I saw the title of my talk is Barriers to Reentry, but we all know it's really not about barriers to reentry, right? It's about barriers facing people of color. It's about barriers facing poor people. It's about barriers facing people we don't value. It's actually much deeper than just the criminal record. The criminal record becomes a surrogate for race-based discrimination yeah. mm -hmm. and class-based discrimination. But what happens in our criminal justice system is really just a concentration of what happens in society in the United States uh, more largely, right? And so we got to be careful not to get caught in that silo. Mm -hmm. Because people in the criminal justice space are not going to solve this problem. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. And all they're going to do, you know, systems of oppression are really durable. And they reinvent themselves right under your nose. Yes. And what's going to end up happening is that if we talk to the policymakers who created this system to try to undo it, we're all going to look back in 20 years and realize that a, an entirely new system of oppression was created right under our noses. So we have to be careful to not relegate the conversation to just right, wrong, punishment, good, bad, because it's not, it's, it's so much broader than that. And that's why so many more Americans need to be involved in the conversation, because they already are. Because they already are. If you look at what's happening in Baltimore, and you look at American reactions, the fact that law enforcement can throw a human being in the back of a van, and the next time we see him, his spine is severed 80 percent, and two days later we're talking about people burning a police car, is who we are, right? Yes. The path of least resistance. Like, let's put the blame on the people that have the least resources to fight back. Right. The governor says, these thugs. Yeah. We didn't call these law enforcement officers thugs just a few days earlier. Mm -hmm. So it's so much broader. So during that time off, I started thinking, what would Dr. King be thinking at this moment? What would he think we needed to move us from moment to movement? I think the first thing he would say is, wait a minute, 65 million Americans have a criminal record on file? And where are they? Why is it that all, most of the rooms I'm in, they're not there? Or I'm the token one there, I'm the trauma porn. Like, why is that? I can't think of any other movement where the people most impacted are not in leadership. And it is a failure of the movement. It is a failure of the field. And we have to change that. Because when folks like me are in the room, they can be in the room as professionals, but they can be in the room with the experiential knowledge, and they can also be in the room to move hearts and minds. Right. Yes. Did you say that again? <laughs> I, mean, just, I, order, I, order I love when people do that. This is not rehearsed, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? Can we get to the videotape? Can we take it all back? <laughs> I think I said, I think I said, People most impacted need to be in the room in a meaningful way because they can be in the room as professionals. Right. That was a point I made. I don't know if that's what caught your attention, right? So, yeah, I mean, the reason I said the piece about people need to be in the room and started with as professionals, because I think people get stuck on it's all about the storytelling. Yeah. The storytelling is important. Right. That's part of moving hearts and minds. But at the same time, I mean, let me just tell you a story. I think this will help crystallize it. I was on the phone about three years ago with two people, one from Harvard, one from Yale, uh, one from a criminal justice reform agency, and me, and we were talking through what a panel, a congressional panel in D.C. was going to look like, how it was going to play out. And when they got to me, they were like, and Glenn, tell your story. <laughs> I was like, you didn't, you didn't read my bio. Um, 
And that's what they want to be there for. They want to be on the panel to tell the story, to help crystallize what they had already figured out, right? Yeah, yeah. They knew what their policy recommendations yeah, yeah, were going to yeah. be. They figured it out. They don't need me for that, even though I had more policy experience than anyone on that phone. Mm -hmm. And the folks who did define themselves as policy experts was, were very academic, not yeah. folks who were back and forth to DC, back and forth to Albany, back and forth to other legislatures around the country. And, and I always remind people of that, friend and foe. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, it's our allies also. Yeah. And I always turn the lens on ourselves. I turn it on myself too. You know, I talk about incrementalism. I, that's me turning the lens on myself and on my colleagues. But the truth has to be said out loud, and people have to be uncomfortable. Otherwise, we don't move. Right. So, so, Just Leadership USA, I think I have about maybe five minutes left. Okay. Um, just Leadership USA. Why Just Leadership? So, so I'm at Fortune. I'm the senior vice president of just about everything that happens there. And, and I take that week off and I come up with this concept paper. It's 15 pages long. And I get so inspired by what we've written that I go back to work and that's my theme music. Um, and I resign. So... I did six years in prison for armed robbery. I'm making 180 grand a year. I have a ton of power, a ton of access. I'm meeting with people like the mayor, like one on one sometimes. And I just walk away from it all. And I walk away from it all because I remember that day when I walked out of prison. I remember that people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. I remember that we lock up some of America's best and brightest, and I wanted to be back there. I wanted to be back in that moment. And I wanted to start from scratch. I figured I would, I would just leap, and I would build the wings on my way down. And I knew it would happen, because if you look historically in this country, that's the only way it's ever happened. Yes. We will not achieve a movement unless we also challenge ourselves about the stigma we have about people with criminal records. I mean, our leadership cohort at Just Leadership USA, all I asked people was, have you ever had any criminal justice involvement? Don't tell me for what. Maybe I'll figure it out down the line. I think every human being can bring value. I think every human being brings value. I don't care what you've done in the past. And so at our first convening, in New York, we did storytelling, right? People directly impacted want to tell their story. I just want them to tell it more effectively, mm -hmm. right? I want them to tell it more strategically. Mm -hmm. I want them to tell it in a way that reminds Americans that there's a lot of other people like them, and it's not just them, that they're not the exception. And one guy gets up front, and they only have three minutes to tell their story. It's hard to do anything in three minutes. And he gets up front, and within 30 minutes, he says, and I raped my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> And that's what happened in the room. It needed to happen because people had to do a gut check. Because they were suddenly like, wait a minute, do I want to get rid of mass incarceration for him too? Do I really believe the system is insidious and we need to wipe it out and create something new but for him? And I watched that group of 20 leaders grow over the next two days grow personally and grow as a cohort. And if I would have singled that guy out because he had a sex offense from 12 years earlier where he got treatment and turned his life around and now has a healthy relationship with his children, we wouldn't have had that moment. And it would have took so much longer to get that group to come together as a cohort. And yet that's not easy for most of us to say out loud. It's not, even allies. It's difficult for people to say that out loud, but I think we have to get there. Otherwise, we lose the argument. Right? If you chip away at your own armor before you even get started in battle, you're going to lose. And you have to be willing to say that this system doesn't work for anyone. So, I'm going to talk about just leadership and I'm going to stop. So, we're a membership organization. We have about 12,000 members already all over the country. 
Um, our members are anyone who believes that our criminal justice system as it currently exists is a huge threat to our democracy, a huge threat to who we say we are as Americans. Why? Because I want to have the broadest umbrella as possible. I want anyone who believes that no more, that we shouldn't do this anymore, to be a part of our membership. And that has been great messaging for us. I know there are other frameworks. We could be talking about civil rights. We could be talking about human rights. We could, there's many different frames you can use. I wanted to use the broadest possible frame. And it came up for me on a panel two years earlier where someone said, people with criminal records can't vote. You don't have a base for reform. You'll never reform the system. And I said, well, what if we had an AARP-like organization on this issue? An organization where if people just said, yes, I don't agree with this, like that would be enough to sort of them to sort of step in and be a part of it. And I hope everyone in this room considers membership. I bought some documents that are out on the table. Uh, the membership is a dollar a month. It's $12 a year. And many of our members are people in prison, by the way. So we have a ton of incarcerated members. And people on the outside sponsor people on the inside. So people join for $12 and then give an additional 10 for people in prison to be part of the membership. And I think that that is how we're going to show Americans that we're all standing together. So membership, leadership, why? How did, I, how did I get here? How did I get here? How did I get here from standing in Midtown with $100,000 in debt, no job, knew nothing about advocacy, social services, nonprofit, fundraising, communication, any of that stuff? Why? People made an investment in me. People made a very deliberate investment in me. And at first, I thought it was going to be a 60-day training or a 90-day training. And a good friend of mine, because I talked to about 200 people after I came up with this idea, a good friend said, well, what are you trying to accomplish? I said, I'm trying to do for people deliberately what happened for me kind of serendipitously over the last 13 years, like all these opportunities. And they said, and you want to do it for 60 days? <laughs> like, and that's how it became a year. So it's a very heavy investment. The cost per participant is about $16,000 for a year. But it's so worth it. And it's still less expensive than most year-long executive level leadership trainings. And in the end, I cannot tell you what it is like to suddenly have these tentacles all across the country talking to each other, supporting each other, elevating each other, amplifying each other. Um, and then we do these one day long trainings called Emerging Leaders Training. So we realize that the core cohort is very competitive. We got 120 applications for 20 slots. Next year we'll have 35 slots and probably get about 400 applications. So we do this day long Emerging Leaders Training for other formerly incarcerated leaders to be exposed to what it is that we're doing. But more importantly, we bring the core leaders in to serve as table captains so that they're the ones building the leadership of other folks. So by the end of the year, we will train about 300 people, not just those 20. Um, and, then, and then we started with a bold and audacious mission. We want to cut the number of people under correctional supervision in the United States in half by 2030. Right. People thought I was out of my mind. Not just for quitting my job, but for saying something so bold. A year later, everyone is saying it. Yeah. Five, am I? Everyone's saying it. ACLU, saying it. Van Jones, saying it. New Gingrich, saying it. And yet, just a year, it's amazing how you plant a mustard seed of an idea out in the world, and you get people to start thinking more boldly about what could be possible. And so I think that if nothing else were successful with this organization, that small piece of messaging was so valuable. And so people often say, why half by 2030? And I give them this whole spiel about thinking boldly and moving the field. And Joshua's going to be 18 in 2030. <laughs> that, for me, is why I have by 2030. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, we think a lot about messaging. I've said it a few times in this talk. Uh, I'll say it one last time. We, uh, you know, we just had an event two days ago with Steve Buscemi, the actor. Um, why? Because some people will come listen to Glenn. Great audience. Thank you. Um, but some people will come listen to Steve, right? Some people will come listen to Benga Akinabe, another actor we had come from The Wire. Some people will come listen to Wyatt Sinak, a comedian from The Daily Show who we've had. So we have all these atypical audience, uh, uh, opinion leaders bringing in new audiences for us. Um, and that's why it was important for me to get up this morning and, and come here, because this doesn't happen without the people in this room. And not just you listening, but you doing something when you walk out of here. And then doing something is not always standing on the steps of the Capitol, right? That's hard. People get back to their regular lives. The doing something could be having a conversation, a difficult conversation, with someone who doesn't yet agree with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you don't get them to agree, so what? If you move them a bit, if you give them something to think about, that is movements, social justice movements are difficult to define when you're in the middle of them. 
one day we will look back and realize where we were today, mm -hmm. even if we don't see it today. Mm -hmm. And so you have to believe that, you have to hold on to that, and you have to believe that things like the Civil Rights Movement, the movement to end Jim Crow, the movement to end slavery, that some of the same conversations were happening in rooms just like this, mm -hmm. And that the people who were in the room didn't just hear it and walk away and say, oh, that was pretty interesting. But the people in the room heard it and realized that they were part of the solution. And if I don't convince you to walk out of this room and realize that you're part of the solution, then I have failed. Because you are. Because it can't just be people like me talking about this. So I talked about privilege earlier. I sort of touched on privilege. What I find, white skin in this country is privilege. Right? And yet I find that many of our allies recognize their privilege and they step away from it. I'm not going to allow my privilege to get in the way. What? You better wield that privilege. Use it. Spend it. People are going to hear you differently than they're going to hear me. That's a waste of skin. A waste of skin. I love, I love, I love when I say something worthy and someone gives me the Twitter version. Anyway, I, I, I'm already over my time. I apologize, and I probably didn't stick to barriers to the end. But uh, this is a talk I wanted to have. Thank you. Okay. This is fabulous. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, so we already know Lynn is coming up. <laughs> John Dye, Harrell, right, you join us, Lynn Burke. So uh, we want to give Glenn a second to breathe, take a, take a rest, and we want to have, uh, oh, this is what you pick up outside that's on the table, okay, so you can join Just Leadership USA, and there's some pins, there's some pins, and there's some pens. So um, spread the word, and we want to thank Glenn for, for coming out here and being part of this conference. So we want to allow um, both Lynn and John Dye to have some reactions to what Glenn has said as people who are incarcerated themselves went through reentry um, and are doing reentry advocacy work. Um, and then we're going to have time for questions and for comments, which Glenn and Lynn and John Dye can react to. So I wrote down some notes, um, and I just wanted to sort of bring up some of the pieces of things that Glenn said um, that I would love for John Dye and Lynn to react to, um, and whatever else comes to, to mind. And I think, obviously, the most important message is the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Um, another thing I took from it is that the law puts up barriers. But then there are practices. There are practices that also are erected to, to prevent people from being successful when they get out. Um, privilege. How do people with privilege support those who are standing up and fighting back? Um, and then something challenging, I think, for people that could drive a wedge in this movement that we can't just deal with nonviolent people who were convicted of nonviolent offenses. Okay, we have to deal with people who are convicted of violent offenses too. Um, and then uh, incrementalism, um, which we we all have to think about how to get over that. And I think of the the Frederick, Frederick Douglass quote: "Without struggle, there is no progress." Um, and how do we engage in the struggle in the way that has our eyes on the prize 2030, you know, um, to really make moves that aren't just incremental reforms and then some of our allies sit back and say, oh, look what we did, that's great. Um, 
And then the other thing is, I think uh, if, if you chip away at your own armor before you go into battle, you're going to lose. I think that's fabulous. And what I think that means is, one of the things that it means is figuring out what is our, what is our unity? What is our strategy for going into this battle? Mark. And so I want you guys to, if you could, start there and, and have some reactions. Anything else that comes to mind? Okay. First of all, I'm very pleased to be here, and I really enjoyed Glenn's presentation. It was fantastic. And as I listened to him, it was kind of eerie because he mirrored a lot of things that I personally went through. Um, I heard my sister's degree in prison the same way he did, came out, and was able to connect with very influential and important people who saw my potential and helped me to move forward and create TCRC and do all the things that we're trying to do, which mirror some of the things that Glenn and Bob are doing in New York. But during the course of that, um, I quickly came to realize that my story, Glenn's story, Lynn's story are exceptional stories. But the reality is there's a lot of people who are returning citizens who are not in that situation. Um, they haven't been able to connect with influential people or find the job niche that they need to move forward or have the opportunity to go to school. A lot of folks who come out with a drug conviction under Pennsylvania law, they can't get Pell Grants or financial aid to move forward. There are so many barriers. So we created TCRC, we created that as a transitional and a transformational tool so that people who are serious about the reentry, about their transition, would have somewhere to come and they could find a town. We're trying to create a culture, a family situation, an oasis from the madness that exists in the streets, a place where folks can come who have been emotionally damaged and find healing, because the majority of us, I, mean, I don't want to say all of us, because there are no absolutes, but the majority of persons who are incarcerated for any length of time come out with some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it may manifest itself in many different small ways, but it's there, and we can't hide it, and we can't um, push it to the corner and try to forget about it. We need to deal with it and move past it, and many times use it as a foundation for our struggle. We tell our people, don't try to forget. Don't put that behind you. Use all that pain and struggle and sacrifice and fear and emotion that you have to power your new life in society. And that's the reality. Um, I keep a pair of shoes that I bought in commissary that I walked in about 10 years on a closet in my house. Um, one of the things that many times when you come home, you're trying to um, do things that are different when you're incarcerated. And one of the things I hated when I was incarcerated is I had such a small place for my personal possessions. I had a lock. You know. And this cell, actually this is a little, um, well, it's, it's, it's about the size. But it was two people, you know. So you really cut them in half, you know. Yeah. I got a locker, he got a locker, there's a the bunk bed here, and the toilet sink is right there. So I got a nice, spacious, two-bedroom apartment, and I turned my second room into a closet. <laughs> my clothes and just my, my stuff. So on that closet, as soon as I come in the door, there's the shoes that I wore when I was incarcerated. So every day when I get up, I look at those shoes. And it's a constant reminder of the miles I walk, of the brothers I walk with. One thing you said it was very important, you know, your tears when you left. I left so many good people behind. I left a Dr. Antulis Shakur behind, who thankfully might get out next year. But so many brothers I left behind who were serving multiple life sentences, one young brother, Latifus, serving 263 years for a robbery. How do you give a 19-year-old man 263 years? It's crazy, but it's what happens. So you leave behind your family, because when you're incarcerated, you form family groups. All human beings need a family, and our family is isolated from us. And we saw them for six, seven hours on the visiting day, and in the feds, they move you so far from home that visits are sporadic. I might have gotten three or four visits a year 
my family members, because they can fly from Philadelphia to Atlanta and go through that whole thing. So you create sons and brothers and cousins and uncles and you mentor and you counselor and you become a father to the young guys and you have to leave them behind. And that's very traumatic. But when you step out into the street, I really believe that the transformation process, and that's what I call it, um, because even though I felt I was a good person and I thought I had a good character, the fact that I was in prison meant that I wasn't a good father. If I love my wife, if I love my kids, how can I engage in the activities that would take me from them for the next 20 years? So I had to face who I was, who I thought I was, and who I could be. So my transformation was trying to become the person and trying to fulfill the potential that I heard all my life that I have. Having potential is not enough. Doing the hard work necessary to fulfill your potential is the key. So for folks coming out of prison, and one thing you said was fantastic, I was in a federal prison. And in a federal prison, in order to be there, you have to have, do some level of activity that's financial. Feds is about the money. Whether it's a bank robber, which I was, um, any sort of white collar crime, drug activity, it's people making large amounts of money that the government has no control over. And that's why you have no prison. <laughs> so you have immensely intelligent people, I'll bet with a criminal mind, in a situation where you are, there's 1,500. So you meet so many crazily smart people who are on a wrong life path. So our challenge and what Matul Shakur taught us was to harness your natural ability and your energy and turn it to positive uses. We had a gang initiative class. We didn't tell Crips or Bloods or, or Gangster Disciples or, or DC Crew or Philly Mob, don't go back to your set, because that's their family, that's their life. We taught, take the things that you learn here, and when you go back, teach them young brothers. Why would your gang create it? Probably originally as a barrier between your community and the police. That's how the Crips got started. That's how the blood, Bloods got started. And then it morphed to something else. So take the values that we are teaching you, take the culture, take your elevated worldview back to your neighborhood and work in your community and do good and atone for the things you've done before. If you sold drugs in your community, you decimated your community. Because that's the effect of drugs. So don't talk to me about the structure and, and white supremacy when you are a tool of that. You are killing your people. You have to go back to your community and atone for that and put in work. So we see TCRC as a culture, as a movement, as an entity to create a new force in American society. In the city of Philadelphia, we have 300,000 returning citizens. Do you mean, you understand what that means if we are united, organized, and moving in a concerted fashion? It means we could take over the city. Every election of note, we could be the side of influence. We could elect the mayor. We could have a great hand in collecting PAs to government. We could influence legislation to the extent that mass incarceration is reduced. I belong to an organization called Decarcerated PA, and you and a half ago we marched from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. We marched because they closed 23 schools in Philadelphia, while at the same time assigning a $600 million budget to the new prison construction at Grade. You know what that means? You know how that's seen in our community? As you value incarceration over education. We can fight against that. We can change that if we move in a organized fashion. Y'all probably, probably heard my story yesterday, so I'm not going to go into that. But I know when I got out, um, the hardest thing for me was I cried too. I don't know if that mic's on. Oh, yeah. It is. It's on. 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 Yeah, it's on. It's closer to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> How about, can you hear me now? There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I cried when I got out too. And I thought that was the weirdest thing. I'm like, why am I crying? I'm just in prison. What's going on with me? And they don't really turn me now. I want to go back or something. I'm like, what's up with that? 
But I know that it was just, I remember that day too, and it was raining. It always rains in my life when things are changing. Okay. Good, and I can't understand that, but. Um, I like to talk more on, a, on you know, specific things that you can do for people that are getting out of prison. And, and second of all, I want to say some things about, you know, how we going how we gonna change this. Now, from my viewpoint, how you hurt folks is with money. Okay, it's all about money. And the only way that we're gonna be able to change what's going on right now is to make it beneficial for these folks. To want to do it. I don't think anybody really understands. They don't care about us. They don't care if we march. They don't care if we walk around looking crazy. They don't care. They still go to the bank and get their money out. You got to figure out a way to hurt that money. That's the only way that's going to make them want to help us. To me, <clears throat> we have to. We have to get a national voting registration up where everybody can let everybody know when things are getting ready to happen and we go down there and vote. Now I know that a lot of us don't have the right to vote when we, initially when we first get out, but everybody needs to let them know that they can vote. A lot of people don't even know that they can vote. No, because nobody really talks about it. In North Carolina, they were trying to take away our vote, even though I already had it. They were trying to take it back away from us and it tells us we have to go and get in front of a committee to get it back. Well, thank God we managed to Get rid of that. But they're still trying it because Republicans run the house and everything in North Carolina. <clears throat> when somebody gets out of prison, the first thing they come and talk to me, I, we, I'm a member of this group called Community Success Initiative. And what, I, what that is, it's a group that kind of um, has taken the North, state of North Carolina and found out all the places that provide some kind of service so that everybody's not doubling up and everybody knows where it is. So we have it on the list. And sometimes we'll, if people write us while they're in prison, I'll let them know where all the things are when they get out and what county they're in, and I'll send it to them. But initially, I tell everybody, like, I, I don't know if I said it yesterday, but when I went to the women's prison after I left speaking here yesterday, and I went up to Muncie and talked with them, and one of the first things I told them, that when they get out, they ain't going to get a job. And I know that sometimes people don't like to hear that, because y'all like to say, yeah, they can go get a job, get a job, get a job, or something like that. No. I have... My JD, I can't go get a job at McDonald's. You know, so let's be real with this. Don't tell people when they get out they're going to be able to go find a job. Because it's not true. Right. <clears throat> they need to go volunteer somewhere. That's what you have to do. You first step foot out, if you can't find a job, or if you don't have somewhere to live, you go and start volunteering at the shelters. Maybe at the places where you have to sleep for a couple months until you get you a place. But the people that are going to help us are the ones that are running these shelters and these programs because they already care like you do. Those are the ones that's going to try to help this person find a job that has a friend that maybe can give them a job because you already find out what they're like because you've talked to them while they've been volunteering every day. That's the only thing that works. Second of all, they got to go to school. And if anybody come in my face and tell me they don't want to go to school, I don't care. You got to go to school. There's nothing else to talk about. I don't negotiate it. If you want my help, that's what you have to do. I will drive them over there to go to school. I will help them set it up. Everybody can get Pell Grants as long as you're not in prison. The only, Bill Clinton did that, took it away, took away everybody, you know, Pell Grant while they were in prison. But you can get it as soon as you get out. No matter what your criminal record is, no matter what you've done, you can get a Pell Grant. You go down there, it doesn't even matter what kind of felonies you have or anything. It has, it has nothing to do with it. <clears throat> I realized early on that the only way that I could go back into prison or try to help people is that if I had a whole bunch of money or I had to have an education. Because if I got the same degrees that they got, they got to listen to me. So that's what I did. And I went back to school and I took their stupid test and I went up in there and now I got all the same degrees that they got. And now they got to deal with me because they're not smarter than me. I'm just saying. Now it scares them to death. Because the more of us that become lawyers, instead of sitting around talking about going to get lawyers, <clears throat> because they can dismiss what you have to say, because if you don't have that little degree that the white people think is important to have, they don't care what you say. And they might pretend like it's okay, and I'm not really including all y'all, don't get me wrong, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the white attitude, I'm talking about the white money. Because even Martin Luther King know he needed the white folk. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, I even consider myself, like sometimes when I have to go do things, and my black friends are like, okay, then we want you to go do it. I'd be the white person that's, that's owner, and they, and they pretend like they the workers, so we can get some money coming in. Everybody plays those games sometimes. Some people that don't know that inside I'm really black, 
So I go play the game. And that's okay for a while because you got to play the little game until you can get ahead of it. You know, we need some help. You know, Malcolm X, man, he said a lot of deep stuff. But he was right. I mean, we can't expect our enemies to give us a job. They want to put us in prison in the first place. You think they're going to get out and say, okay, there you go, get well. No, they want us in there. They're guaranteeing beds now. And now they even got the Spanish people talking junk about black folk. The black Spanish people saying, why don't you just give us our, uh, uh, green, give them their uh, social security card so we can work because black people are lazy. That's what I told you that. The white man gave you the job. You. That's what they're doing now. They're trying to play them against each other. So, so again, I'm sorry, I get off point. If you really want to help somebody, help them find a place to go volunteer. Second of all, help them get their driver license back. Nobody got their driver license when they get out of prison. Because that's how usually the ball starts. And that's another reason why they're locking people back up. Because in North Carolina, driving without license is a misdemeanor. And it's enough for them to go back to prison on their parole. And all you have to do, which has been working for me, is when they get out, it costs like $8 to get a copy of your driving record. I don't know how much it is up here in Pennsylvania. Get a copy of that driving record and see what's on there. If any of those things that they had that says failure to appear were times when they were in jail, they have to dismiss that. Because it wasn't their fault they weren't there. So, you know, and that'll help somebody get their driver's license back. And I'm telling you something, you talk about raising the standard of liberty for the community. You get somebody there. For what your vision of justice is, um, uh, then educational tools that I guess have very specific references so people can, can back it up, investigate it themselves, and it's not just sort of a paragraph saying this, 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 this. Yep. Um, white privilege. White restate privilege. your quote. Yep. <laughs> and white privilege. I think the quote, the, the talk will be online, so you can watch it online. Okay. What, what I think is interesting about those police officers um, finally um, getting indicted is the fact that um, they got to go home. Like right after that, they, I mean, and then there was another guy who had a bond on him. He's in jail, but these, they, I mean, who gets uh, a bond? I mean, gets to walk out on your own recognizance for murder. Right. I mean, sometimes I feel like some of the stuff that's going on with some of these governments is just a facade. That after everything rolls over and everything's gone or whatever, they'll just let them go. Yeah. Now I'm not saying that. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I, I feel like sometimes when the man has to go to jail, you know, maybe they'll, they'll understand how bad it is and want to fix it. I don't know, but I know that that's wrong to let them just walk out of there and go back home. Because to me, you know, a regular person, or especially a black person who had committed that crime would not just walk out and go home because you got a murder charge and just wait until you come back to court in a couple weeks. I just don't see that. So there's a, there's a, there's a I don't know what's going on there to me. That's just, I hear what you're saying, and it's a very emotional situation, but if you adopt the strategies of your enemies, you're going to be just like them. Right. So. So I agree, like, so hold on, hold on, let me, let me try to respond to this. I'm sorry for jumping in. I, I got a mic stick. Oh, oh. Up, I, I am not a prison abolitionist, actually. I do believe some people need to be locked up. I met, pe I met people in prison who belong there. And, and I grew up in a very tough neighborhood, and I get it. At the same time, the fairness that's afforded to these officers, I would like to see it afforded to everyone in the system. Yes. 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 You know what? I imagine that if we were sitting here having a discussion about slavery, people would be saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Or about Jim Crow. If you look at Jim Crow and how deeply rooted those laws were in our country, I would have probably said the same thing. Like, no way. I can't even envision something else besides what we're doing right now. But people got together and did it and made it happen. And it's not... You don't need the entire country. Wasn't it Margaret Mead that said, never doubt that a small group of committed individuals can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Yes. And so it takes imagination. I get it. Five years ago, I, I was probably in the same space that you're in. But I got to the point where I was like, if we don't start having imagination, we'll never move from the moment that we're in. That's very true. And Mike and Abby and I were in Baltimore this afternoon, and we'll probably go back tomorrow once this, once this conference is over. And you can't believe the incredible energy and excitement and elation that those young people brought to the streets yesterday in the aftermath of that decision. They finally felt that there is a possibility for justice in America, and that's an amazing thing to happen. 
I'm a, some folks call me a, a pessimist. Um, I call myself a realist. Mm -hmm. But when the Mike Brown indictment was going on, I said it'll never happen. Right. When the Eric Garner situation was going on, I also felt it would never happen. But when I saw those kids take to the street and set Baltimore on fire, I said, something's going to happen. Right. I don't know if it was going to be all six. Yeah. But yeah. the reality is, the reaction of those young people in the streets forced this decision. Right. If they had said, there's going to be no arrest, no indictment, Baltimore would have gone to the flames. Right. And they recognized that, and they responded to that. I think there's hope for the system. Unfortunately, it took violence to do that, but America was built on violence. Right. So why are we surprised? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, basically, uh, two comments. Uh, one is, I didn't hear any difference between your argument and Lynn's argument about jobs. I just heard her speaking to the, the tough truth that getting a job for a, a person coming out is very difficult and uh, takes, a, uh, takes time. And I didn't hear her suggesting that they shouldn't get a job. Uh, the other thing is, I, I want to address the question of um, uh, sex offenders. Um, the idea of, of ranking crimes, to me, is, uh, is just a very bad habit. Uh, I, I've spent 10 years going in uh, and spending time with people. And uh, I never talk about their crimes. I don't have to because the people I spend time with um, are just so amazing and so worth spending time with. I don't need to know what they did. Sometimes they tell me, but um, uh, it doesn't matter to me. And you know, every time I've heard uh, Michelle Alexander talk, she says, we are all criminals. And I think we should all take that very seriously. It's really easy to say, shrug and say, oh yeah, right, right. But uh, I think that's a, that is serious. I know in my own life, I have committed crimes. I was a soldier, right? I spent a year in Vietnam. Uh, I've committed crimes. And we all have. I'm sure if we examine our conscience, we will be able to see that we have committed crimes too. Ranking people in, 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 uh, as to their worth, uh, as, as offenders, as criminals, I think, is a very big mistake and we should not do it. Okay. Thank, speak to you. That briefly. Thank you, brother. We never finished the white privilege question. Okay, we'll and, also, really important. and also a vision. You know, we'll what is our vision? That's important we'll too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll I just back. want to make sure we hear from as many people as possible and we'll make sure we come back to those things. Earlier this week in the New York Times, New York Times had an article about how every declared candidate for president has a position against what they're calling over-incarceration. The Koch brothers, right now, every single month, they have a new statewide conference on why we need to end over-incarceration. What they're moving towards is moving people from being incarcerated to be under community supervision with always the threat of going back. Um, and I am doing my work in Georgia. The Georgia legislature this year uh, created a new department, Department of Community Supervision. And particularly in Georgia, we have a lot of private enterprises that make a lot of money off various aspects of probation supervision. I wonder if you might address how we keep our eye on the ball when we have clearly a movement that's going to be moving from people being mass incarceration to mass criminalization yes. on the outside if we're not paying attention. One more, one more question, comment? Okay, Sean. Mm -hmm. I think this might be a, little, a slight elaboration on what the last questioner was asking, but we were talking about throwing people under the bus. So my, 
the question that seems always to be a challenge for people who are looking for reform versus a fundamental change. Is it better to take what is possible or is that in the eyes of the people who are in front of us more dangerous because it will erode the possibility of fundamental change. Mm -hmm. And it's just a it's a question that is always pregnant in in the work. All right. In the interest of us, you know, maintaining a nice flow, let's take two questions at a time now. So we can you know, keep in mind because now we're going to report. All right, so let's go back to um, the um, sex offense question. The reality of ranking of the criminals is the reality we live in. All right, if you live in a prison society, you don't have material goods, and you don't have the the um, your job and your all the things on the street that make you who you are. What you have is your character, how you act, and often your offense. You know. In prison, we rank people the same way they do in society. It's the reality of life. You know? So to say it's wrong, yes, many things are wrong, but it's the reality. It's so how we deal with that reality is how you have to see and discuss and create conversations around. In terms of a vision, my vision and uh, TCRC's vision is that prisons should be a transformational experience not for punishment. Prisons could be think tanks, universities. Often it is the first time in a person's life where they have the time and inclination to work on changing who they are. That should be our focus. There should be more community oversight of prison so that this is done. Send in volunteers. Send in real social workers. We don't trust the social workers and the psychologists who are there because they work for the system. Send in civilians who truly have our best interest heart, teachers, Reinstate the Pell Grants, make it so that when you go into prison, it's a true learning experience, and you come out of that ready to deal with society instead of so damaged that you can't function in society. Yes. It's <laughs> to the fact that it's often easy for women to get overshadowed on panels and give you a chance to respond. <laughs> 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 It's not possible to overshadow it. Okay. It's not possible. It's not true. Um, anyway, I, I I don't know. I guess I I'm trying to and and I love y'all. I just think it's cool. Everybody got these ideas and stuff like that, and how perfect world should be. But I live in the South, right? Yeah, I live in North Carolina, man. It's just not, <laughs> not happening. Um, I just take a lot of joy in little accomplishments. You know, I think, I know for me, parole was a good thing. And it was a good thing because um, if, you can, if you can have a good relationship with that parole officer, she can protect you. And they know you're all right, you're not going to bother them, you're going to do all that, then that's a great, you know, I'm always looking for you know, someone can back me up because nobody believes anything you say unless we got somebody that ain't done nothing. So I, I would surround myself with people that can protect me. I do that now, even in the courthouse. I don't go in there by myself. I bring a law professor with me. I take other people with me because they're coming at me. And it's not paranoia, but like having a community corrections rather than being in prison. Well, that might be a good thing if it was for a short period of time. And if the inmate didn't have to, quote, pay for it, if you're not going to get them a job. I mean, as far as being a woman's concern and our children, you know, um, after a year because of Bill Clinton, if we're in prison, they can terminate our parental rights. And they're taking these kids, and then they're putting them in these homes no matter how old they are. If they have a relationship with you or not, they're, they're, they're going to be 13, 14. They take them and put them in these, other, in these homes, get adopted, and then this, this, the um, Department of Human Services gets $10,000 for doing that. In the last three years, state of Alabama, has got over $5 million from the federal government for taking people's kids away and putting them in, 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 in adoptive homes. And we're talking about adoptive homes where you've got 10 to 15 kids in there. Are you seriously kidding me? Is it not obvious what's going on down there? And you think anybody's doing anything about that? And in the meantime, they don't give money to parents who want to keep their kids. Maybe if you give them $10,000, I bet you they can 
get their kids back and get a place to stay and try to get a job to do something, but they're not doing nothing like that. The majority of them are African Americans, again, trying to break up families. So, in my view, if it wasn't for me having my children, I never would have been able to get up after getting out of that place. And I know that if we don't put these kids and these mothers back together, and I think fathers are important too, but it's different when you birth them. They're, they're part of you. And, and, and what we're doing is we're creating another generation of inmates. Because they're starting to think that going to prison is a normal thing. It's a rite of passage to some time. Oh, it was to prison, it's okay, I go to prison. But you're, you're only what you know. If you don't know what's normal, how can you be normal? If you don't know what a normal family is supposed to be like or how things are supposed to work, if you don't know that, then that's what happens. And all we're doing is creating another generation. So to me, if we don't start fitting these families back together, and if it has to be with community supervision that these mothers can keep these kids with them, then that's what we have to do. I mean, sometimes a little bit is better than nothing for a little while so we can stop these children from going to prison. And um, so, I, I, you know, I understand everything that that would be good or, you know, it's bad if you transition a little bit. But, I mean, right now how it is is, is, is disgusting. And a little bit of change right now, I mean, is better than nothing. So I gotta tell you, I'm on panels all the time. What I love about this panel is we disagree with each other, right? So there is no sort of homogenous population of people who serve time in prison. Like, we have differing opinions. And, you know, I mean, I'm listening to you, and the reason I'm able to say, okay, like, let her say it. She's from the South. I know in the South it's a different world, you know? And, and your measure of what you can achieve is defined by what you're surrounded by. And I understand what you're surrounded by. I work with a lot of people in the South. I get it. Um, and in fact, you know, as the South goes, the rest of the country goes. You know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, privilege. So I'm going to try to answer that question. You know, I'm, I'm not an academic. I often feel like I, I give responses that are not overly complicated. And I hope that's a good thing. So let me try, let me, let me try to respond to that in a way that's not overly complicated. My success as someone who served six years for a robbery over the last 13 years, I mean, I have been in rooms with uh, uh, Supreme Court justices, people like Richard Gere. I was just with Steve Buscemi a couple of days ago, Desmond Tutu. I have been at every, if I would spend this much time at Ivy League institutions when I was 18, I wouldn't have went to prison. Like, I am always in those spaces, and I recognize that a big part of why I'm in those spaces is because of my light skin and my straight nose. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like my father's white, my mother's black. A big part of why I'm so palatable to white folks is because I'm easy to talk to and listen to. A big part of Michelle's success in her book Amen. is that she is not Angela Davis. Amen. Right? Amen. And so now let's go a bit further, right? So if I were a white man or a white woman, particularly white men, but a white woman, you have the ability to say things out loud that people give value to that they don't give to people otherwise. And you have to, it's hard to, like, it's hard to explain to a fish that he's wet. And, 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 often, and often it's hard to explain to white people what their privilege looks and smells like. Yeah. Yet people of color live with white people's privilege every day. Yeah. We think about how you're thinking about us. We think about whether you're nervous about us. We think about whether you're defining us a certain way. Like we live with it, like it is heavy on our souls. It probably kills us a lot sooner than other Americans because it is a trauma and stress that we have to live with in this country. But the flip side of it is that you guys have this power and that some of you are willing to acknowledge it and then do something with it. So what does it look like? It looks like the ability for you to say the same damn thing I'm saying and yet have people give it more value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no magic here. It's really not magical. Like literally, if you can say some of the things we're saying in this room to other people who are white in this country, they will give it more value coming out of your mouth than coming out of mine, even if you said the exact same thing. Does that help? Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Any more questions over here? No, we got Galen back. <laughs> I um, just wanted to say that I agree with Lynn. I think there is a need for more attorneys that are forward thinking. Um, it's not a woman thing. It's not a woman thing. But as a woman who um, founded an organization with an, an attorney, 
he was the only one that I could ever call on in an emergency to help people who have gotten the mess beat out of them in, in prison or there's not very many pro bono attorneys in New Jersey who want to step up to the plate to represent people in prison. And there was just times that he would just look at me and say, well, are we going to get paid for this day? And I'd be like, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> but he would still take the case. So it is a need for forward-thinking attorneys to get involved with this prison um, movement that we got going on here. And it is definitely a need for women who have been on the front line, like myself, like this woman, to be a part of these places and spaces so that we can tell our truths. And I also think that we need to involve the Latino community a little bit more yeah. in these because they are the second largest population of our prison industrial complex. Thank you. I know I've been annoying people around here with my great concern. Uh, when, when Tyrone said yesterday that the bottom of this problem was the 13th Amendment, I just said, you know, I, you're so right. Because it was years before I knew there was a second half to that 13th Amendment. I mean, I was always, the 13th Amendment freed the slaves, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't read that it made us create a Jim Crow in all those years. Of, of, of that we suffered, that I suffered. I want to know what would it mean if we, well, I would take back to the Unitarians, I'm going to go to GA, and that's our whole state nationwide thing. If this conference could say we are going to work to get the 13th Amendment amended, <laughs> I wonder what that would mean for all of us, because like Tyrone said, and I agree, it's the root of all the trouble here. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to change things overnight or that we're going to get Hillary Clinton to say, I agree, and that's going to solve everything. <laughs> or even if we got it this morning, I don't know. But what, what would it mean if we could say that we're going to work to root out this problem where it began? Now, I talked with John about it, and he said, well, a lot of, a lot of people are, are, are doing this. Yeah, I talked with other people about it, and they said, oh, it's going to be difficult. What has been easy? You know, I don't know. It seems like to me we could do that. And we could start that, but not start it. I'm not saying we're going to start it. But it would be a nail, another nail in the coffin. And I would like to see us do something about that nail. I, mean, that's all. I think that's a wonderful idea, you know, and we've got around the world. I just want to say, I just want to make sure everyone knows what she's talking about. The 13th Amendment says slavery and voluntary servitude shall not exist in the United States unless you've been convicted of a crime. Right. So in effect, we've been slaves, and, and yes, we were slaves. Um, you need to have long-range strategic goals that you work toward, and that's a great goal. But um, something important, as Matt said a little earlier, there's a law, and then there's a practice. Yeah. Even, even if they change the Constitution, then the next fight would be putting it into practice. Exactly. Um, I don't want um, exactly. a, a um, okay. that Sarah asked a little while ago to be overlooked about the, the change from incarceration to community supervision. Yeah. This is insidious yeah. because, yeah. as I said earlier, that was the worst part of my incarceration. Right. Right. I felt so disrespected and so violated that one day I got to the point where even after 18 years of trying to transform myself, I wanted to call somebody out and do say, look, come over, put the guns in the trunk, and go in that place and kill everybody with a red shirt on. That's how badly they treated me. You know? And I had to sit on my bunk and center myself and say, breathe and you know, think of all your experiences. Think of all you've done. That's the level of terrible conduct that is in community supervision. So these sort of ideas sound good on the surface. Take folks out of prison. You know, put them in halfway houses, monitor them, help them. They don't help them. If I had to go on, my six months in that situation was a setback for me. I had to struggle and endure so many things. And I tried to say, I knew it was. I told my counselor, I don't want to go to halfway house. They told me, if you don't go to halfway house, we're going to put you in a hole. It's going to be a year before you can get out. So I went, knowing how crazy it was going to be. 
We have to really fight against ideas that sound good or are really insidious moves by the system to extend their control. In fact, who called Lynn? Lynn was saying outside earlier about Tyrone still being on parole. I think Tyrone's on parole for life, isn't he? Yeah, we're going to try to fix that. All right. Listen, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, how can you be pardoned by the governor but be on parole for life? That means he has an axe hanging over his head every day of his life. That's insane. Wow. Glenn, could you comment on I was, I'm, I'm just going to echo what he said, which is I, I love when people, uh, are visionary. I think that's hugely visionary. I think it's a great target. You know, when I when I worked on Rockefeller drug law reform in New York, um, what I noticed after we were successful is that the advocacy community dissipated in a way that was disheartening. Why? Because they lost something that they were like hugely passionate about, even though we had a win. And I always believe that we have to have that. We have to have that goal that we're just like hugely passionate about. And I think the 13th Amendment, no matter who you are, like if you look at mass incarceration, you get that that is catalytic, right? That's a big part of what got us here. And so I, I, I like that fact that you're willing to have that long-term target. Because if that's your target, no matter where you fall, you're going to do really well, right? right? And, so, and so I appreciate it as, a, as an audacious target. And then the only nuance I would give about this idea of community-based versions of uh, punishment is that it's not only the right proposing it. Uh, there's a professor at uh, UCLA, Kleiman, who's very progressive, who had an article in Slate.com called uh, We Can Punish Criminals Without Sending Them to Prison. Yeah. And what he didn't tell people is that his co-author is someone who actually is in the tech industry yeah. and yeah. believes that yeah. there are ways for folks in Silicon Valley to make a huge amount of money by incarcerating people in their homes, in their communities. Um, and so there's a financial component there. Um, but we, you know, this is why, yes, less incarceration is important, but I think we can actually do less of everything. Right? Because even alternatives to incarceration. So I used to work for an alternative to incarceration program. And so you might say, well, let's do more diversion. Let's do more alternatives to incarceration. But you know what? Every time something is proposed, we end up growing the entire system. Why? Because again, the underlying uh, value of our system is punishment. So no matter what you add on to it, it's not going to be instead of. It's going to be in addition to. So over the years, you know, while prison has grown, so has parole, so has probation, so has diversion courts, right? A veterans courts and drug treatment courts and reentry courts, so has alternative to, you name it. Everything a brilliant person has come up with, whether they are conservative or progressive, has just done nothing except expand the entire system. So that's why, yes, we have to take the incremental wins, but we have to have that long-term vision for changing the fundamental things that got us here in our system. Lynn? John, I let Lynn talk. Sorry. Oh, I'm good. One of the things that really impressed me yesterday when I was in Baltimore is so many of the young kids who were speaking said, this is a victory, but it's just the beginning. And what you're saying about you know, winning and then folks dissipating. I didn't see that atmosphere. They were saying yes. Yes, and. Yes, and what are we going to do next? And that's so important. No, we have to move forward. You know, we have to think. All right, let's amend that, all right? Then let's make sure it's, it's put in practice. And what's the next step? Because mass incarceration has so many layers, and it's a 24-7 hour business. They work all day, all night, all week, all month, all year, and they're constantly evolving as an entity. It's an $80 billion organism, and they're going to keep on growing unless we oppose them, and oppose them on many levels. That's why we keep saying it's so important to support the organizations who are in the forefront. I can't stress that more. You know, um, my fellow Quaker always saying, what can we do? You know, I go to white privilege conferences, and they say, what is a white person can we do? You can support those in the community who are doing the real work, align yourself with them, come work with us, come to North Philly and work with us. It is wonderful to be here in this great surroundings talking about this. Come to 3850 Germantown Avenue. It don't look like this outside. Right, right, exactly. 
Okay, we, last two um, questions here, and then um, a wrap up of the panel. We have lunch um, from noon to one, and then we have a great uh, conversation afterwards with two amazing women talking about how families are impacted and how families outside can advocate for their loved ones inside. So, Diane. I would be remiss if I don't have a question. I'm making a comment. And I would be remiss and not like myself very much if I leave tomorrow morning and I don't say what I've been on my heart to say all of this time. As a teenager, I read a book. I don't remember the author, but the name of the book is Who Needs the Negro? And the author's um, point was that just like Indians were put, Native Indians were put on reservations when they no longer had a need for them, because slavery was about economics, when we no longer need that economic base, it doesn't say that it would just erase slavery. The book says that what they will do, and that's the people in power, is to exercise their racism to the maximum and exterminate black folks just like they put Indians on reservations. So to me, I know there's been talk here about racism and that being one of the keys. To me, it is the major key and that's what needs to be eradicated and that's a mindset. So when one of the speakers talked about racism as an illness, I clapped my hand and laughed because it really is. And I won't be here tomorrow for any discussion about what's next. But I just want to tell you that in my personal opinion, a lot of you may not agree with it, there are people that's incarcerated that's not black. But the system is about incarcerating and keeping black folks down other folks may get caught in the net, but they are not the target. They are just consequences of that target. Yes, Can I take a moment to ask um, my brother in the back to stand up? Anthony Dickerson, could you stand up, please? Anthony Dickerson is the um, co-founder of the Black Party with me, and my um, closest associate in, in TCRC. And he's the author of that um, uh, White Supremacy as a Mental Illness. He's a brilliant paralegal. And he said, if you talk to Michelle Alexander and you don't ask this question, I won't say what else he said. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Get to know him, you know. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, you know. I want to go back home and, you know, be fighting outside the office. That don't look good. <laughs> the um, question was, should white supremacy be classified in the DSM, the Diagnostic Physical Manual, as a mental illness mental disorder? And he's a brilliant paralegal. So I'd like to end on that note, having any of you with final, final um, reactions. I want to convey at this point, because I guess this will be the last time I get to say anything, is that um, women are treated differently than men in all aspects, even in prison. Um, even now, as I'm trying to get my license in North Carolina, you know, men can commit all kinds of kind of crimes with drugs and guns and whatever they do, but they are sowing their royal oats, and men grow out. Women don't. Women have something wrong with their character. And women are treated totally different. I had forgot all about it because I was so busy fighting the race card for so long with my biracial children that I forgot about gender. And it's even evident in the prisons. And do you know that they treated women the same as men until they realized, I heard one of the correctional officers say when I was um, at another conference, they realized it when they needed more toilet paper for the women. Duh! But that's how they started realizing, oh, we maybe we need to do something for women. But they're not addressing that what happens to the children when we go to prison. 
Nobody thinks about it. Even when we're having some of our meetings, when we got some of the money in North Carolina to try to do reentry work, and I was telling who all the guys were there except for me, and I was telling them we need to set aside some money for the daycare for when the women come to these programs so they can have someone for their children to be. They just went on. It's all the time. And, and women, the population in prison for women is tripling. And it's the highest, um, uh, more people, more women are getting put in prison than men. It's just the highest um, rate, rate, rate of increase, right. So I guess some of the opinions I might have might be different than them. Uh, because I'm more looking at, you know, uh, what's going on with the children and the fact that the majority of women are in prison because they were, they had victims, they were raped and um, you know, something happened to them when they were younger and they're using drugs, almost like 80%, 90% of them. They're doing no counseling for any of these women or any of these programs. When they get out, they go right back to the situation. Even some of them in the prison are acting it out. Like they killed their husbands who were beating them to death, and then they go to prison, and then they have a relationship with a woman, a she-boy, what I would call them, and they do the same thing to themselves again. So I guess I was thinking more about community than them being able to get out and get their children back and try to get themselves together and getting that kind of counseling that they need that they can't get in a prison. Mm -hmm. But um, I just hope that when you're thinking about all your programs and the things that you're trying to do, just remember that women are different. And we need different things. And just put this little group with ex-offenders and stuff together, it doesn't work. It, we, we, don't, we don't learn like that. Meeting you was the most exciting part of my day today. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I'll say. I, about five months ago, I went to Mumbai, India. And if you've ever been to Mumbai or anywhere else where there's stark poverty, there's this fatalistic attitude that like nothing can be done. I remember a little girl coming up to the cab window and begging me for a dollar, having the cab driver speed off to the point where she almost rolled off the car. And when I had a conversation with him afterwards, he sort of said, there's nothing you can do to help the poor. Like, there's just nothing. Like, even if you gave her money, it would do nothing. There's nothing you can do. It's just, it's who we are. And I often find that when we do a great job of explaining mass incarceration, that's how people sort of walk away. Well, what can I do? And I often find myself having to remind people that we can look at many other oppressive systems in this country, but this particular one, 45 years, right? Like, you can wrap your mind around how we got here. You can look at the policies and the decisions we made that got us here. Our democracy got us here, and our democracy can get us out, and you are our democracy. And so, I, and so what often happens in these rooms is that I, I walk away, and although we've done, uh, I think, a, a beautiful job of helping you guys understand the complexity of this issue, People walk away saying, well, yeah, well, then I just don't know what little old me can do about it. And I, every time I give these presentations now, I want this to be the last thing I leave you with, which is that is just not true. Nothing happens if you don't do something, period. And you will look back and have to explain to your kids and your grandkids what your role was. And what do you want to be able to say? Do you want to say, I heard some really great presentations, but I thought it was a bit too much and I didn't do anything? Because I'm, I'm leaving here in a few minutes. I wish I could stick around. But I'm driving back to New York to spend the rest of my weekend with Joshua. Yes. Right? And each person in this room has a Joshua in their lives. And you have the power to make the future for them and for yourselves different. But only if you walk out of this room and actually do something. So that's what I want to leave you with. Yes. What I'm going to leave you with is that you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you can do. You know, you can write a check. You know, you could volunteer. You know, you could find resources. You know, if you know an employer who will hire every attorney citizen, you know, you can call us. If you know somebody who has an apartment, housing is, is a critical. You know, people come home and they need a room and they need an apartment. One of our biggest challenges is finding housing for a person who might have a job, but is making eight, nine dollars an hour and he can't save enough for a security deposit and a month in advance. 
homeowners. Because we're trying to convince the realtors and homeowners who own property, let them move in with just the first month's rent, you know, and they'll pay it every month. You know, employment is so important. We beat the bushes for a job. And many times the people in this room might so know somebody who owns a landscaping company or has a small factory or is doing something and if you talk to them and say, listen, do you hire returning citizens? I know a guy who has great workers, hire them. Small things like that, you know, talking to your family, your friends, your neighbors, changing minds. Use your white privilege and use your connections and use your thought process to change the system bit by bit. That's how changes come in small increments. There's never going to be any mass movement that overnight is going to transform things. It's hardworking people doing small things day by day that transform society. And we've seen that at all phases of our history. When there was slavery, there was a, a small group of Quakers and abolitionists and free blacks who put their lives and reputations and energies and privilege. Yes, money. Yes. Privilege. And privilege on the line and says, this is wrong. This has to stop. All through the civil rights movement, people abandoned things they were doing and did marches, sit-ins, and put their lives in danger to move forward. We aren't asking you to put your lives in danger, but we're asking you to, although if you had been in Baltimore yesterday, you might have, they had you crazy later on. But we're asking you to commit to this struggle. It's gonna be a long-term struggle. Thank you.